Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hocking Hills United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Charlene Mitchell, and it is so good to see you all this morning. Many of you decked out in your red for Valentine's Day. So tomorrow, be sure that you give someone you love your greetings um, of, of well wishes. So as you are making your way to your seats this morning, uh, before we go into a word of prayer, I'd like to encourage you, uh, whether you are a regular attendee or you are new here this morning, to fill out the connection card that you received from our ushers as you were coming in. Uh, that helps us with so many different things in the life of the church, with uh, letting us know that you're here, if you have prayer requests, if you're taking sermon notes, and then you are welcome to um, split that paper in half and as the ushers are coming around we encourage you to put that in the plate or if you don't get a chance to there are wooden boxes mounted at the rear of the sanctuary that you can drop those in before you leave but those are such a great tool here in the life of the church for us to use if you have little ones with you today while we don't offer nursery care during this service there are activity bags in the back of the worship area that you're welcome uh, to take one and, and let your little ones uh, color and have some activities during the service today. And then of course, after our service, we invite you to stay for cookies and a cup of coffee at our Perfect Blend Cafe. But welcome to worship this morning. I invite you now to come to the throne room with me to greet Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come into this place of holiness. And Father, it is our desire that your spirit would just rush in, fall afresh on our minds and our hearts, Lord, and fill us, Lord, with all of the good things you have prepared for us today as we once more meet you. So Father, we just ask your blessing on this service and all of those, Lord, who are either gathered here or joining us online this morning. We pray these things through your son, Jesus, who gave the ultimate gift of love to us. Amen. Enjoy our prelude this morning.
Good morning. Welcome to the journey service here at Hocking Hills United Methodist Church. I'm Ryan Weiscarver. I serve as your music director, and I greet you and wish you a very happy Valentine's Day. Um, please stand and join with me in singing our opening hymn. And as we sing our opening hymn, if our ushers want to go ahead and get ready to take our offering in the back. And as you're being seated, we invite our ushers to come forth to receive your gifts of tithes and offerings and also your connection cards. And so before you, Lord, we present to you our gifts of love. Father, we thank you for your provisions. And Lord, receive these gifts back with a happy heart as we present them to you. Mold them and make them, Lord, into your future, into your church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this morning, I invite you to be in the Word with me today in the book of Zephaniah. And today we'll be in the third chapter, verse 17, together. Zephaniah 3, 
verse 17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Are you perfect for each other? What is your favorite movie? I'm an action film kind of guy, so the more guns, the more explosions, the better. A good romantic movie is more my speed. My favorite movie would probably be White Christmas. What's the best part about your spouse's favorite movie? When it ends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's your favorite place to vacation? Disney. Disney. What about Disney is magical? Being with my family in a fantasy world. The animatronics, the innovation, it's so high tech. And family. I mean, don't get me wrong, but family. That's why we go. Wow, 70 years? 70 long years. <laughs> In all your years of marriage, did you ever consider divorce? Often. <laughs> divorce? No. Murder? Do you disagree a lot? Well, we're different, but we're similar too. I mean, we both really love Taylor Swift. I'm into all kinds of stuff. U2, Coldplay, all the way to more Coldplay. I'm more of a Barbara Mandrell kind of girl. Yeah, she likes both kinds of music, country and Western. So who controls the radio in the car? The, the kids. kids. Have you ever had a heated disagreement? This afternoon. How did you resolve your differences? How did we resolve it? We prayed and then we're different people, but our similarities are as many as our differences. We are very different. But we have so much in common. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. <laughs> yeah, we are pretty different. My wife has made me appreciate the grace of God that I have found in my wife, as well as the beauty that I saw in her when I spotted her for the first time those 74 years ago. 70, 74 years ago, that's right, that's right. So how can every day be like Valentine's Day? Um, every day he gives me back rubs and foot rubs and makes me coffee. So does he fix things around the house? Every day he gives me foot rubs and back rubs and makes me coffee. You know, on February 14th, people expect the gifts. You should be doing something special like that for your husband or wife every single day, making them feel loved every day so that Valentine's Day is not a departure from the norm, but it's right in with the pattern that you've been setting the entire rest of the year. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> we haven't really had time to hit those trials in marriage that you always hear about, but if times really get bad, she knows I've got her back. And he knows I've got his back too, even if I can't reach it. My goodness, <laughs> and that's something we find we have a lot of differences uh, as we are married to our spouse, a lot of similarities, but it's great to see, you know, the topic of love is definitely in the top three topics talked about in the Bible, if, if not the top topic in the Bible, and depending on your version of Bible. King James Version has maybe about 335 so times it mentions the word love, but if you go into another version, it could be up to 550 times it mentions the word love. Uh, so this is kind of the topic today of uh, looking at the week ahead. It's been a, a big week. It's a big day today, isn't it? It's a big Super Bowl Sunday. We got a local guy 
vying for the championship, uh, give a prayer out for the Burrow family, will you? All the positives he's brought to Athens County and uh, the wonderful uh, ministries that have been flourishing because of this current spotlight. Uh, so it's a big day. And then tomorrow, Valentine's Day. So it's a big week, isn't it? Um, there's an old legend, and it, it's a legend, uh, but it, it's about a wealthy merchant, merchant of the first century uh, who wanted to meet the Apostle Paul. And there were a lot of people, actually in the book of Acts, when Paul was under house arrest in Rome, there were people who would go and meet with him. So it's not too far-fetched, but it's a wealthy merchant who heard the, of the Apostle Paul, and he encountered Timothy, Paul's uh, protege. So he arranged a visit with Paul, who at that time was, of course, a prisoner in Rome. He stepped inside of Paul's little house, and he was surprised to find a rather old man, physically frail, and, uh, but his serenity and his magnetism challenged him. They talked for a few hours, and finally the merchant left with Paul's blessing. Outside the prison, he asked Timothy, man, what is the secret of this man's serenity and his power? I've never seen anything like this before. Oh, well, haven't you guessed, replied Timothy. Paul was in love. <laughs> the merchant looked a little, a little bewildered. He said, in love? And he said, yes, Paul was in love with Jesus Christ. The merchant looked even more bewildered. He looked back at Paul in his house and said, well, is that all? And smiling, Timothy replied, sir, that is everything. That story is itself again a legend. But the truth in this story is that, yes, Paul was indeed in love with Jesus. And Paul's love was real and that what made it so powerful was the fact that God first loved Paul even when Paul was named Saul and persecuted the church. So I have a scripture reference for you. If you have your connection card, there's a place on the card where you can put down some notes. Maybe you write these scriptures down. Maybe you go back to them in this week and you reread them and reflect on them. But here is 1 John chapter 4. It says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. And so there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. In other words, they have not been made to have this relationship with Jesus. Because we love him because he, what's it say? He first loved us. So this is a clue to the kind of love we're going to be talking about with Jesus and grace. A certain fear of God, which is commonly defined as a reverential respect of God, is appropriate. But believers, believers like you and me, we do not have to fear God's wrath of a coming judgment because Jesus bore that wrath for us when he went to the cross. Little Johnny wasn't a very popular boy at school. In fact, you know, he was really not liked much at all. You know, he was high energy, struggled a little bit here and there, and really made sometimes uh, the other students feel um, stressed. But Johnny loved Valentine's Day. It was his favorite holiday, or and far and above Halloween and, and even Christmas. And he'd start early. He'd get his list together looking for those special valentines for each of his schoolmates on his list. And, of course, he'd take his mom to Walmart right when they would get that wall of the valentine stuff out, unlike me, when I come after the rush has come. Johnny was there to pick the first pick of the crop. But all of this effort seemed to be astray because he would never receive a valentine from anybody at school. Another Valentine's Day rolls around. He's got all of those special cards ready to go the big day. And off onto the bus he goes, protecting those cards so they would be ready, spotless upon his revival. And as he boards the bus and the bus goes out of sight, his mother 
standing there, tears filling her eyes, soon cascading off her cheeks. How she dreads that evening when he comes home from school, knowing he's probably not going to get a single card in return. She prays diligently for him all day. And soon the bus rounds the curve and comes to a stop in front of their house. She goes out on the porch and Johnny comes off the bus. And she hears him as he's coming up the path. Not a one. And her heart broke. Then again she heard him say, not a single one. She didn't know what she was going to say to her son. But as he approached, the expression changed to this huge smile. And he shouted these words out. Not a one. I didn't forget a valentine for a single one. Love is is not about what we receive. Love is more about what we give. And when we look at uh, the Bible and we see verses, most of us know John 3, 16, don't we? And we talked about this verse a little bit during Advent, but, but it says, for God, what's it say? So... He loves, so love the world, the world, not just one people, not just one nation. He loved the world that, what does it say? He gave his only son that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish, but they'll have eternal life. Now, Americans spent $27.4 billion on Valentine's Day in 2020 the year of the COVID, that was the all-time high recorded. And last year came in second with $21.8 billion. So we are very uh, knowledgeable of expressing our love to our loved ones. Just think about this today. We want to talk today about this type of love, but have you ever written or received a love letter? Maybe it's uh, today it's a text message <laughs> or it's a Zoom. Maybe when you were dating, you got out a pen and a paper and you, and you wrote that special someone you liked. When I was in school, when we liked somebody, we'd write down on a simple message on a piece of paper, if you love me, check yes or no. Boy, how much has changed since that time. Maybe you have a love song that you and your spouse have deemed that's our song. Today's youth are more likely to have several ways to express that. But what if God wrote you a letter? What do you think he would want to say to you? Maybe our thoughts might lead us to this image of God pointing his finger at us, giving us commands, almost kind of like a drill sergeant. But what if God were to go further than a letter? What if he were to write you a song? What type of song would God write about you? Maybe it would be a country song where God would lament over how you broke his heart. Maybe it's a rap song where God would cast judgment on you for you you not being so great of a lifestyle. Maybe it's a classical song because you have a repeated history of habitual poor choices. Or maybe it's a pop song. You've got to cast a little judgment on you today because you've been a fool in many ways. Do you think God would use the opportunity to judge you and condemn you? You Just think about that this morning. What kind of an opportunity? What kind of a song would God write about you? Well, if you're wondering if God would write you a letter, you don't have to wonder any longer. He already has. And what is so much more powerful is that in this letter, not only has he written to you a letter, he's written a song for you. A love letter with a love song by a God who will stop at nothing to get you to see how much he loves you and me. The love of God. Today, I want to share with you concerning this love of God. And I want to do that through two areas of scripture that stand out to me about this amazing grace that God affords to each and every one of us every day. You heard the gentleman on the video say, Valentine's Day shouldn't just be set apart as the day we treat our spouses special. We ought to be doing that every day. And Valentine's Day is just one of those days, just like the rest of those days. That's a great thought. That's a great thinking about how God views us in his love for us. God doesn't pick just Sunday. He doesn't pick just 
Christmas Eve. He doesn't pick Easter Sunday only. He picks every day to give you this special kind of love. So I want you to think about this as we look at the Apostle Paul. This love was enough to take a battle-hardened Pharisee who vehemently pursued and persecuted and murdered Christians and turn them into the Apostle Paul. He was known as Saul the Brutal, but he became Paul the Apostle. So I want to talk to you about this love of God. The love of God is the highest form of love there is. It's more than friendship love. It's more than romantic love. It's identified in the Bible as the Greek word agape, love. So if we look at these three types of love identified in the Bible, all three are great. And I want you to picture yourself going up to the gas station. And I want you to picture yourself taking your car up and you open up uh, the uh, fuel tank and you get the uh, fuel handle out and you've got some options. You've got 87 octane, 89 octane, 93 octane. And you look at the price and you say, oh, oh man, that 93 octane. I think I'm going to go down to the 87. It's cheaper, all right? So if you look at these three, God chose the highest form of love for you and me. Amen? He chose the most costly. And if you uh, fill up your tank at this gas station, maybe you start out, you think about your relational living, you think about how your relationship with your better other half started. Maybe it started with that romantic love, that uh, eros kind of love. And, and that was uh, a kind of love that got you going, Right? But then, uh, after a time, it kind of wore off. And you need that friendship love, that philos type of love. Friendship love is important. But ultimately, you're going to need to get to where that couple was for 70 plus years of marriage. You're going to need this agape love. This is the highest form of love there is. And this love of God is very powerful. And through his love, he displays his mighty power. So let's take a look at Numbers, an Old Testament verse, out of the book of Numbers. He says, now, may the Lord's strength be displayed. How is God going to display his strength? Just as you declared, here's how God is going to display his mighty power and his strength. He's slow to anger. How many of you are slow to anger? Think about God, slow to anger. What's the word say? He abounds in what? In love, he's abounding in it, forgiving sin, praise Jesus, and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He's a holy, righteous, just God, but yet he displays this mighty power through love and forgiveness. The love of God is unconditional and it's measureless. It's not based on any social status nor any amount of money you have or you don't have. It's not based on what you've done or what you haven't done. It's not based on how good you've been or how bad you've been. It's not based on the amount of good works you have done or haven't done. It's not even based on any amount of money that you have given or not given. It's not based on the amount of time you have or have not given in service to the church. And it doesn't matter if you've attended every Sunday or if you've never attended a single Sunday in your life. God's love isn't based on anything concerning what you do or don't do. Unconditional means it's not subject to any conditions. Let's take a look at three verses this morning. Here's the first one out of the Psalms. Psalm 13, verses 5 through 6. But I trust in your, what kind of love? It's unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Amen? Has God been good to you? Has he blessed you? Does he love you? Does he care about what you care about? Is he concerned about what you do during the day? If you hear the scriptures, you should know God is concerned about you every day. His love's unfailing. You should be rejoicing. You should be coming in and praising God. He's been so good to me. Well, often we say God is good. And you say, and I say all the time, and you say, God is good, right? That's the psalm. Psalm 13, verses 5 through 6. But let's move to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. 
But because of his, what kind of love? Great love for us. God, oh, I love this, who is rich in what? Mercy. He's rich in mercy. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Read the last part with me. It is by grace you have been saved. Nothing that you have done. It's unconditional. It's there. That's how you are saved. Let's go to the a third verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what he says. How great is the love the Father has, what's this word, lavished on us. He's basically taken us and poured over us, rubbed it in, absorbed it into us, this love that we, we get to be called the children of God. And that is what we are with an exclamation point. But it's hard to accept that God loves us unconditionally in that way, isn't it? I mean, does God really love me? Would he love me that way if he really knew me? And he knew my thoughts, he knew my past, he knew my habitual sins. Would he just change his mind about me? Has God really forgiven me? My guilt is real, but is his love real? God's exclamation point that settles any and all debates about his love for you comes in the form of a cross on a hill called Calvary. The love of God. It's amazing if we can take away the distraction, center ourselves on the imagery of the cross, and as you leave today, you're going to walk out and you're going to see our illuminated cross, and we want to remind you as you leave that it was on this cross that Jesus gave his life for you. Amen? I want you to think about this topic. There was a certain medieval monk who announced that he was going to preach his topic next Sunday evening, on this topic of the love of God. Of course, the church was packed. Very popular subject. And the shadows fell. The light ceased to come in through the cathedral windows. The congregation had gathered, and in the darkness of the altar, the monk lit a candle. He carries it to the crucifix, and he illuminates the crown of thorns. And then he illuminates these two wounded hands. And then he looks and marks the spear of the wound in his side, and then the hush fell as he went to the feet and saw the nails in the feet. And then he blew out the candle and left the chancel because there was nothing else to say about the love of God. But what is so amazing to me is I sometimes find it hard. It's not hard for me to sing to Jesus, to praise him. Um, what's the song we opened with today? He has made me glad. Now, what if God were to reverse that and say, you have made me glad? It's hard for us to kind of grasp that God would write us a love song. But that's, in fact, what we see in this prophet Zephaniah in verse 17. The prophet Zephaniah is announcing to Judah, which was the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom Israel had already fallen many years prior and here is Judah and being judged and of an approaching judgment which is going to come at the hands ultimately of the Babylonian Empire. But Zephaniah's main theme in this coming day of the Lord when God was going to severely punish the nation, but yet also he makes it very clear that God would be merciful towards his people and he ends his pronouncements of doom on a positive side of Judah's restoration. Ultimately, it is those people who ha will humble themselves and in repentance seek forgiveness from the Lord. And it is those people who are rejoicing and singing over the Lord because God first sang over them just as we were able to love God today because God first loved us, 1 John 4.19. We are able to sing over God about his love for us because God first sang over us in the language of forgiveness the lord rejoices over his people he delights in them he cares for them 
Yet the severity of the judgment message reverberates throughout the book that it heightens our sense of wonder at this astonishment of God's mercy and His grace. Although God is holy and righteous, He is also merciful and loving, and His love is limitless. But yet we also pay heed that there's going to come a day of the Lord, a day of judgment, and He in all justice and righteousness is the ultimate judge of all the deeds of all of us. And as we who have come humbly in repentance and salvation to the Lord, we rejoice, we praise God in this amazing grace that He saved a wretch like me. I saw a truck that had a sign on the back of its window. It says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I was the wretch. <laughs> I, will, I am the wretch that he saved. Think about that. But for others who show no remorse, they show no repentance. They are going to be judged by their sins and deeds rightly and justly. And so Jesus reminds us in Luke 5, 32, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why do you need to come to repentance? Because God's holy. Because there were coming a day of judgment, of righteousness. And so when we see Zephaniah, the first part of this verse, verse uh, 17a, next uh, the verse 17a would be the previous slide, I believe, there. So let's go back to this. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst, the mighty one will save. I want you to try to absorb this for a moment. When is he, what is he really saying here? Could you imagine in any kind of a circumstance in your life when you, need, when you need a warrior by your side? When you need someone to stand with you in the onslaught of, of whatever is attacking you in life. You need, you need a hero. And what this verse is saying is that God is that mighty warrior by your side. Nothing is going to f- cause him to run away from helping you. Nothing is going to cause him to step aside and not be by your side. Nothing is going to cause him to be so afraid that he will not be- have your back. Amen? That's what he means when he says he is the mighty one who saves. This God is a mighty warrior who will not be intimidated by anything or anyone. And you might be standing there and your knees are cracking and you're so afraid of the future, but God is right there to be by your side, to walk with you, to protect you, to lead you and guide you. This is the mighty warrior that Zephaniah describes, the power, mighty power of salvation Word is God, it's God's love that is this power. So the mighty warrior implies that God is this strong warrior who has the ability to conquer the evil and sin of this world. He's a powerful warrior who sets free the captives and they find strength and safety under the wings of his protection. And this mighty warrior's power is his love. So we take great comfort in knowing God is with us and for us. Those who trust in the name of the Lord are those who have been in humility, repentant, and they've made Jesus Lord of their life, just like the Apostle Paul. Just like Timothy would say to this rich merchant. He said, isn't there anything else? And Timothy says, no, this is all. Your judgment is removed. Your enemies, the vehicles of wrath of God, they're turned away. This king warrior is now in your midst, but now... You need not fear the disasters or as in the day of the Lord. And now there is a cause for great rejoicing. There is a cause for great singing. There is a cause for a great praise service, not only by those who were redeemed, but also God rejoices over the redeemed. And so let's go to the latter part of this verse today. As it says, he will take great delight in, what's it say? In you who? He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. In other words, God is saying, let's have a wonderful praise service. And I am going to sing over you because I delight in you. My love is being made complete because you are humbly repentant. And you trust me with your life. And I am going to sing over you because I love you. 
That's what the balloon says right there. It says, I love you. If I were to look at this verse today, I were to look at uh, one of my favorite pieces of uh, candy hearts. Couldn't find them this year. They probably were all sold out before I got to Walmart or any other place. You remember those candy hearts that had these little messages? I tried to get I tried to get one particular message to the girl I liked with her Valentine card. And on that little candy heart, it said, be mine. You remember that message? Be mine. I, I felt that was like the way, best way I could say it. Be mine, you know. This is God rejoicing over you. If God could give you this heart, it would say, be mine. Be mine. Because that's how much I love you. Here in this verse, we find that joy becomes the key to unlocking the message of God, not only for Israel, not just to the nations, but it's for every one of us living today. The heavy sentence of judgment has been changed from death to life, from tragedy to rejoicing, making a way for a future that's completely different than the one that had been forecasted, and it's totally different from the past. For some of these privileged few today, this is very shocking. This isn't the way the justice system is supposed to work. But ultimately, this word that comes to this prophet of doom was more about the future than it was about the past. It was more about those who would inherit a wonderful future than about those who will be punished. It is the faithful who are rejoicing in what perhaps is most shocking hard for us to grasp at times is this God who loves us amends this judgment sentence and then he also rejoices among those who have been released to live another day in a new way in the transformation of their lives by this amazing grace of God and he is singing a love song over us God is on the move he's on the move in our time he's on the move in this church because he is always going to be there for you and me. And he loves us so much. And he wrote us a wonderful love letter. And in the love letter, he wrote us a beautiful love song. As we see the story of, the, of salvation. Try to picture salvation, the story of it, as a love song. Of how when Jesus came, he walked with us, taught us, healed us, lived with us, but then died for us and then rose for us. We're coming up on the verge of uh, here in a few weeks of Ash Wednesday, March 2nd. And as we do, we think about that 40 day Lent season that leads up to Easter and all of the th events in Jesus' life, his trial, his crucifixion, his resurrection. Look at it as notes on a music page. As they play out, think about how God is preparing this concert. He steps up to the microphone, and his voice is so beautiful, so awesome. And he begins to sing. And the song is about you. That's how much he loves you.